Together we all take a very deep breath. We see in the middle of our mind a little ball of golden light. We watch this light as it begins to grow larger and larger. Until now it covers the entire inner vision of our mind. We see for ourselves within this light a beautiful temple. We see a garden that surrounds the temple and a body of water that flows through the garden. We see that the inside of the temple is lit by the same beautiful golden light. We are here for we have been drawn together by the power and in the presence of God. To him we devote this time spent together and our relationships to one another. And we ask that his Holy Spirit, which is within our mind, so guide our thoughts and our feelings and our perceptions that we might grow to become happier and more peaceful and more loving human beings. Thank you very much. Together, we all say, Amen. Tonight, I want to talk to you about the idea of emotional self-sufficiency. You know, uh, when the feminist movement was first beginning, there was all that one of the aspects of it was the idea of um, a transformation in women's thinking in terms of men, quote, taking care of them. Because there had been, you know, kind of a, a general cultural assumption that it was sort of okay for a man to support a woman. And it, uh, what the basic feminist notion was, was not that it was necessarily bad for a man to support a woman financially, but rather that it not wouldn't shouldn't be assumed that that's sort of the way things work best, that rather a woman should be equal and that women could go out and should go out and at least think of themselves as as um, making their own living. Now, if a man was, uh, let's say, a married couple, if, if a man is making the living and a woman is raising the children, that's something different. But in, just in general, the idea that a woman should, know, should not look to a man as the means of her support. Well, there's been a lot of changes along that line, and I think that that's generally been accomplished. But where it seems to me we're still a little stuck, and where this does not have to do with just women, we has to do with all of us is the idea that even though it's pretty, you know, generally assumed that everyone should think of themselves as um, providers of their own financial support, it seems to me that it is not totally kicked in for us that we also assume that we are all responsible for our own emotional support. That even though we know that it's uncool to look to someone to support us financially so that even if we do, we pretend that we're not emotionally, we haven't yet realized that it's really the same issue. Now, what happens when you are looking to someone else to be your emotional support is, is that you are not standing on your own two feet, obviously. And so you are looking for someone to fix you. You are looking to, for someone else to come and to complete you. And of course, the ego, the, the mind of fear within us, which the, you know, the Course in Miracles says is the part of the mind that is not in touch with God, dominates the culture. And so it dominates the cultural mythology. And so the cultural mythology plays along with the game. You know, it's like you'll be complete once they get here. Right? Now, the cultural mythology is not, I'll pay my bills once he gets here. <laughs> right? But the cultural mythology is, I'll be complete. I'll be total. I'll be full once he gets here. Now, you know, I, I, I've mentioned here many times what a revelation it was to me in my life when I realized that I had been thinking that a man would someday arrive in my life who would take away my desperation. And finally it occurred to me, why don't you handle that before he gets here? <laughs> what man was going to meet me, what man I want was going to meet me and say, God, there's this really great desperate woman I'm... <laughs> now, from your damaged parts, you can attract certain people, damaged ones. <laughs> your damage can be attractive to other people who are equally damaged, and a lot of that is called modern relationships, right? So the idea is about taking responsibility. You know, I found in my life, it, I, I actually found materially as well as emotionally, I never attracted anyone who could take care of me until I took care of myself. That was just my experience. I didn't, it didn't work for me that way. It has never worked for me in any area of my life. You know, we have this myth that you're going to find somebody who's going to come do it for you. 
and is going to come bring you into, pull you into that next level of manifestation. I have never found that to be the case. What I've always found in my life is that when I've owned the energy myself, when I've done the work myself so that it's bound to occur, not because somebody else is doing the work, but because I've done the work, somebody shows up who sort of is that next place. They are that next place, and so then in the physical realm, it might even look like they pulled me up, but they didn't pull me up. You see what I'm saying? Because until you own the next energy system in your path yourself, then even if you find somebody who ushers you in, if you don't own it yourself, you won't be in for long. Now here we're talking about any type of energy system. You know, it's like the myth that you're going to be on the drugstore stool and somebody's going to come along and produce you. Get rid of it. Produce yourself. Because until you produce yourself, what's in it for a producer? Right? What's in it for someone? So why? People, do you go around looking for a person behind you? Do you go around looking for a person who isn't as far along as you are so that you can, uh, can pull them along? Because if you do, you're ill. <laughs> right? That's not what the undamaged person does. The undamaged person is looking for playmates. You see, that's what, what the, what the, what the, what the system, the healthy system holds is not that we're, you know, it's like the mythology is that we're all incomplete, but we're going to look for someone to complete us. But the truth of the matter is if you're incomplete and looking for someone to complete you, a complete person would not be interested. So if you're incomplete, a complete person's going to walk by. The only thing that you're going to attract is another incomplete person. So it's two emotional invalids joined at the hip. Great. Right? And that's what a lot of what the ego mind uh, glorifies as a kind of modern love, right? Now, the Course in Miracles says that what's supposed to happen, what happens in the enlightened realm, is that two com full, fully complete human beings find each other. Like I said, I never found someone who, to, who, who would come along and take care of me materially until I already took care of myself materially. It just That was just my experience, but it showed me something. And that has happened to me in any area of my life where I've achieved has been areas where I wasn't looking to someone else to do it for me. But the last area I got that about was emotionally. In fact, I held on for a long time. This is my experience, but I held on for a long time to the notion that, oh, I take care of myself financially, I take care of myself in the world. When am I going to come find someone to take care of me emotionally? God. And I felt God say, never. It doesn't work that way. The reason everything's okay in other areas is because you didn't think someone was supposed to do it for you. And people will come into your life, as indeed they have, to, quote, take care of me emotionally when I was already doing it for myself. Because like attracts like. Abundance attracts abundance. That's how it actually works. So what does it mean to say you are emotionally, uh, you are responsible to yourself and that no one's going to come along and fix you? Well, then I said, oh my God, you mean no one's going to come along and fix me? No one's going to come heal my desperation? Nobody's going to come and fill the giant gap inside? The problem was, because the answer, like I said, was no. No one is going to come along and fix you. No one's going to come along and heal your desperation. No one's going to come along and fill this gap inside of you. Why? Because if someone comes along to fix you, they are by definition agreeing with you that you need to be fixed. If they come along to heal your desperation, they would by definition be agreeing with you that your life is desperate. And if they come along to fill this giant gap inside, they are by definition agreeing with you that there is one. And your perception of the problem is the problem. Now that seems to me the challenge of age. Because on one hand, the older we get, the more we know we should be growing in God's love. And what does it mean to say growing in God's love? Well, where is God's love? God's love is our own higher self. To grow in God's love means to grow in our own integrity, in our own character, in our own sense of personal power, in our own beingness. Okay? On the other hand, living in this world, the older we get on a certain level, the more damaged we are. I love, someone told me the other day that someone said to Krishnamurti, can you learn from your experience? And he said, of course not. And I understand the level on which he meant, of course not. Because remember, we are tempted. You know, we've been through relationships that have hurt us. We've been through things that have, have damaged us. We've been through so much that on an ego level with every relationship, it tempts us to, to hurt more. 
it tempts us to be more convinced of how much we need to be healed. But the real truth of the matter is, as the Course in Miracles says, that the only reality that was in your past was the love that you were given and the love that you were received. I found myself saying to someone not long ago that if I, it was very interesting because it was how the ego works. I said something like, well, my experience has taught me or something that I would never trust in relationships again or something like that. And I got off the phone and I realized, now that was a lie. You could say, but this person, this person, and this person, you know, your ego could be tempted to say, boy, I wouldn't trust again. And then this person, this person, this person, and this person, you could look at and say, boy, I believe in the process. Boy, I, I got a lot from that one, and so did they. But the ego mind had gone right to the perception of pain. And that's the problem. The problem is not what had occurred. The problem is what my mind had done to point to the negatives that had occurred and identify myself with those. And as long as I identify myself with the negatives that have occurred in my life, then to that extent, I'm always looking for someone to make it better. So then the problem is, of course, not about someone coming in to make it better, but the idea that I think I need to be made better. I could just as easily focus on the positive. And, you know, it seems like such a small difference, but it's a tremendous difference. It's a tremendous difference because it totally determines how you enter into the context of a relationship. You either enter, you know, we always say you go into every situation through love or through fear, which is the same thing as saying you go into what has to do with your perception of yourself. And coming from fear, coming from wound, always means coming from the past, but coming from the storyline. So what? It's been hard for you? Guess what? Who here has not had a difficult time on, in, in relationships on some level? Join the human race. You know, it's like we, we say here all the time, you came from a dysfunctional home. Who didn't? There's that wonderful uh, uh, thing that Werner Earhart says, which is that he points out that the way peacocks make peacock feathers, the way peacock feathers are made, is that peacocks eat thorns. They actually eat a poisonous substance and thorns, and those thorns, when digested, become peacock feathers. The issue for us is that anything that we have been through can contribute to our beauty. Anything that we have been through can contribute to what we are in a positive way. And so to say that we bring our past with us and to say, you know, like when Krishnamurti says you can't learn from your experience, I understand the level on what he's talking about in that the objective experience itself is not what teaches you. What teaches you is what you choose to learn which is the same thing as saying that you were taught by what you choose to teach others. The Course in Miracles says you teach based on what you want to learn. So if you go into a situation saying, I am wounded, you are teaching the other person, demonstrating to the other person, I am wounded. Even if you're coming from a place, I'm looking for someone to heal me, what you're saying first is, I am wounded, which will be your experience, because it's your word. And if instead we teach, I have been through what I have been through, it has it, it has made me more of a believer in mankind if I choose to be more of a believer in mankind because you know who's to say what was a relationship of failure or a relationship of success did it teach you how to be more loving that's up to you and if it did teach you how to be more loving if you did choose to be more loving in spite of you know we talk here all the time about the innocence of a child versus the innocence of an adult the innocence of a child is beautiful but I don't think it's as beautiful as the innocence of an adult the innocence of a child is based on the fact that they haven't seen any reason not to be trusting. The innocence of an adult is when we have seen what can go wrong and we still choose to love. And when we have seen what can go wrong and we still choose to love, when we stand forth in that position, it's because we know that our essential self could not be robbed. Sometimes in the essential self could not be wounded. You know. That's the value of experience. I don't care what they've done to you. They can't take away, you know, like I saw, and they can't take that away from me. You can't have taken away from you your essential self. Now, sometimes when you've been put on the floor, when you've been through a terrible relationship, when awful things have happened, or a so-called terrible relationship, it does seem for a while that something essential was robbed. A woman was saying to me, actually, recently, she said, there used to be a light in my eye. And after the tragedy that I've been through, she said, I, I don't think I'll ever get that light back. I told her that she would get back a different light, that the light would never be perhaps as, as frivolous as it had been, but it would be the light of a deeper woman, and the light would be just as bright. And that's the choice that we have. I always say to people, you won't be the same person 
after certain experiences, you will have a choice. You will either be harder or you will be softer. Which you will be is up to you, and that's the meaning of emotional self-sufficiency. Emotional self-sufficiency means I and I alone determine my own healing. My healing is not going to come from somebody coming into my life and fixing things, because in order for them to do that, they would have to share in my perception of myself as a victim. And so they're not doing me a favor. And if they're sharing with me in my perception of myself as a victim, then how can I be healed? Because as long as you think that you've been a victim, you will not be healed. The ultimate healing is to know that you're fine and that nothing touched your essential self. That's why it's okay if we were molested as children on a certain level. Please don't take that out of context. That's okay if we were abused as children. It's okay if we have been abused on any level. Our essential self was not abused. That's the meaning of, of, of spiritual responsibility. Self taking care of ourselves spiritually is to understand the truth as God created it. And that's what it means to say, ye shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. The truth is, our essential self cannot get sick. Our essential self cannot be wounded. Our essential self cannot be victimized. Our essential self cannot die. If you have a disease, you don't have the disease. The body has the disease. Krishnamurti, speaking of Krishnamurti, he used to speak about his own physical pain in third person. He didn't say, I was in pain. He had terrible back pains. He would say, there was pain. He wouldn't say, I am in pain. Because your pain is determined by whether and how you choose to interpret your pain. And so remember, when we say, dear God, please take this situation away from me, we are not saying, make the facts different. We are saying, show me how to reinterpret the facts. And that's what emotional self-sufficiency is. Emotional self-sufficiency doesn't mean, well, this happened to me, and then this happened to me, and then this happened to me. If you want to do that, you can do it. But my point here is that anybody that you attract who wants to do the sob story to any great degree with you over it is going to be as damaged as you are, so ultimately you won't be getting out of out of the sob situation. The Course in Miracles says, don't try to get into the battles in life and win the war. The Course in Miracles says, rise above the battleground. And to rise above the battleground in life means to know that there is a level of truth that God created where we're all fine, where we're all perfect, where the only thing that was real about your past is the love that was given and the love that was received. Sometimes I see the temptation. I see the temptation in relationships sometimes to just think of myself with battle scars. But the problem is thinking of yourself with battle scars. You haven't been through battles. You have been through lessons. And the greatest gift that another person can give to us is sharing that perception with us. So that we go into a situation and, you know, it's like sometimes when you say to certain people, how are you? You know, and certain people always say, they either tell you how bad things are or they do this one, I'm all right. <laughs> and the whole energy in the room just goes, <laughs> right? Now you tell me, are they fun to be around? Right? Is that attractive? Now, really, what they're doing is they're saying, please give me love, please give me energy. But when they're coming from that place, you don't feel like it. Their lack doesn't make you want to give forth of your abundance. But if they say, I'm fine, it makes you want to be around them. I mean, it's really common sense. The second coming, the Course says, is a return to sense. There's a way in which it's so obviously just psychological common sense. To know that for us to be emotionally self-sufficient means to know that no matter what I've been through, I have total freedom in how I choose to interpret it. And I don't have to choose to see myself as a victim. Now, if you do, the problem is you do go into situations wounded. You go into situations wounded, and by going into situations that way, you will continue per to perpetuate it. So what does it mean to say that you go into a situation unwounded? To say you go into a situation unwounded means to know that we are complete beings. Your soulmate, you know, a lot of people think that your other half is going to come and complete you. You're going to meet your soulmate. But as long as you think you're waiting to meet your other half, what you're saying is only half of myself exists now. And if you're only on half beam, then I would think that even if your soulmate got here, they wouldn't be attracted. Doesn't that make sense? Your soulmate is attracted to you in your full magnificence. Some people seem to think, well, if I get there, what would a relationship be? A lot of people think once we get healed, what will happen in life? That's when the fun will begin. 
The fun will begin when we have relationships, not where a half a person meets a half a person, but where a whole person meets a whole person. And then the expansion of joy and love, it's not like you still want to have things to learn. We will still have areas where we need to be healed, of course, but our basic primary perception of ourselves can be that we're fine. You know, somebody said to me once, who had been through a lot of tragedy in his family, he said to me, people, it's not that people don't want to hear about your pain. People don't mind hearing about your pain, but they want to hear that you're doing something about it. So the energy. Do you know what I'm saying? I don't think that we're supposed to go lying to people and pretending that everything's great when it's not. But we are supposed to be coming across with an energy which says that I own what my experience is and I'm dealing with it. I'm in the driver's seat. And just as that makes, that the, the universe responds to that, you know, with money, if like if you're stating your attention to take care of things with money, that's why we say here all the time, if you have a bill, don't just and you're overwhelmed by it, don't don't just hide it in a drawer somewhere. Write the company and say, I know I owe you four hundred dollars, all I can afford to pay you now is ten dollars a month, but from this moment forward I'm doing that, sincerely yours. You start paying that ten dollars a month or whatever you can afford, and what the universe reads from that is your intention to take care of business. And so the universe will support you in that. Same emotionally. When you, through your own beingness, express your intention to take care of business, then the universe will send you everything that you need in order to do it with. Now, you know the term demons and evil spirits? This is real. Evil spirits. What is spirit? Spirit is mind. Spirits are thoughts. Evil spirits are negative thoughts. Negative thoughts about ourselves. Oh, it's been so terrible, and I'm so bad, and I'm so small, and I'm so wounded, and I don't know how to do it right, and everything I do is bad, and I'm a total mess, and I'm a total fuck up, and I can't, all that stuff. Those are called evil spirits. They're called demons. And that is the darkness, and in the presence of light, the darkness is gone. And so we have to take an active role in casting demons out. That's why, that's what an exorcism is, when the priest casts out the demons, casts out the devil. And all of that is happening in your head. And that's what the priest is. That's what we do as spiritual companions for one another. I was having a conversation with a girlfriend earlier today, and she exorcised me. I was upset about something. And then she spoke to me. That's what we do as spiritual companions. We tell each other that which we all already know, but which is not so easy to remember when you're in the middle of it, right? It's like if, you, if you're if you ill, I can sit and say to you, but your illness isn't real. God did not create AIDS, therefore AIDS does not exist. And you might say to me, well, that's easy for you to say. And my answer to that is, yes, that's why I'm saying it. If I'm in a situation in my own life where I'm all upset about something, you can more you can more easily see the abstract principle, the abstract truth, and you state it to me at a time. And I'm some people think, well, Marianne Williamson, she's she's got it figured out intellectually, she wouldn't have those problems. Uh-uh, it's a completely different thing. You might know it intellectually, but the power of the word, hearing it spoken, we all, after a certain point, if you've been to enough lectures, if you've read enough metaphysical books, you you know it intellectually. Knowing it intellectually is not the issue. It's the emotional. Demons are, are emotional. Demons are, are such deep thoughts that our emotions become overwhelmed by it. And in spite of what we know, we can't believe it. And so that's what, what the spiritual companion, that's how the priest exorcises the demons. Because the priest in the, in the enlightened context, in the new consciousness, new spiritual context, is not a different person, but a place we find within ourselves. So we are all here to be ministers to one another. We are all here to be priests to one another. So when my girlfriend started saying to me things which on a certain level I already know, it was what I needed to hear at a time when my own emotions were such that I knew it, but I, I, it wasn't kicked in. It was like here, but not there, not down here. And so the point is for us to all become clear on principle and then to state it to one another. That's why your healer is not someone who says to you, oh, I know, it's been terrible. <laughs> That's not your healer. That's not your ultimate healer. And uh, not also, then it can, and you can see for the same reason, then that wouldn't be the person who would come and heal you in the relationship itself. The real healer is someone who says, I know you feel that it's been terrible. It's a, it's a temptation. I understand why you're tempted to think it's so bad. I'm a human being too. I can understand. But that's not what really is happening. That's not what's really true. All of this negative stuff, these are just demons. All of this negative stuff of what happened in the storyline and who did what to who and who's sick and who, who abused who and all of that stuff is in a realm that the Course says we made up. 
It is not our essential self. And for us to stay here in the battlefield and try to fix it is not going to fix it. What's going to heal it is that we all rise above the battlefield and remember who we really are. The Course says the only problem we have in life is that we have forgotten who we are. We have forgotten that we are beings incapable of wound. We are beings incapable of sickness. And once we know that we are incapable of being wounded, we won't be wounded anymore. Look how Jesus healed the leper. Jesus stands in front of the leper. But Jesus knows that all that's real is what God created, our strength, our love. Jesus looks at you if you have leprosy, and he knows that you can't have leprosy. You're a child of God. But Jesus is so convinced of the fact that in his presence, the leper doesn't believe in leprosy either. And because the leper then doesn't believe in leprosy, the leprosy is gone. And that's what we're here to do for one another. But we all have to place ourselves in the position where we are willing to receive the real healing. And the problem is that some people aren't willing to receive the real healing because they don't want to give up the perception of the problem. Haven't you? We've all known people like that. You, they're telling you how bad things are, and any time you make a comment that might help them see it differently, they, they skip over it real quick. They really don't want to hear it. What they really want is for you to just agree with them about how bad things are. And so the willingness to be healed brings unto itself the voice that will help you be healed. But you have to take the first step, the, the taking responsibility within our fact, uh, within ourselves of saying, I can see this differently. I'm willing to see this differently. The pain is not giving me enough of a payoff. I want to be, the Course in Miracles says actually that all healing, even physical healing, the Course says, is accomplished the moment we, we really understand, I don't need this. It's not giving me anything I want. Now, I know sometimes that's very difficult for us to get to that place. And I'm like everyone else. I'm not saying that that always gets me out of my pain. But I know that my knowing that I am responsible for the establishment of my own mental, uh, my own mental outlook in such a way that, that I, I get that I don't want to be in the area of the problem anymore. I really want out. I am willing to see this from above the battleground, then brings unto me the people, the situations, the books, the tapes, the whatever. I mean, it's everywhere. Truth has many, many faces, which enables me to exit the plane of the problem. And that's what it means to say the risen Son of God. And that's what it means to say the, the self-sufficient Son of God. Not looking for anyone to do for us what we are not doing for ourselves, but are willing to do enough for ourselves that it brings unto us everything that we need in order to complete the job. So that means that once we are willing to say, I am a complete human, I am a complete human, I am a complete human, that doesn't mean that people will stay away. It means that people will come unto us who are attracted to the idea of your already being a complete human, that a strong person is the most attractive. Some people will walk past you. If you stand forth in your full glory and your full power and your full strength in any situation, there will be people who go, whoa, that's too much for me. That's true. It's too much for them. There's a Yiddish expression, Gegas unter hates. It means, bye, God be with you, please move. There's someone behind you. <laughs> and that's the story. The story is not about sickness. Sometimes I think these days that there's a real temptation for our generation to get a little too interested in our neuroses. We're a little bit too, too enamored by our own, by the analysis of our own neurosis. But an analysis of your neurosis does not justify it. To say, well, I'm this way because this is my disease. So. The bottom line is still be different. Be determined to be not as you were. And that's what it means, the Course says, to be born again. We are born again in any moment that we go into a situation leaving our past behind, leaving behind the perceptions of our past. It doesn't matter what you went through yesterday. It doesn't matter what was done to you. It doesn't matter any of the stuff about your wounds. What matters is the healing. Every situation that we go into is an opportunity for the healing, the opportunity with the healing that has to do with you and the person that you meet. But if all you're bringing into the situation is a crybaby routine about how bad things were in the past, don't expect to do anything but to perpetuate the past. If instead you come into any situation willing to be that which you desire to be, knowing that the payoff of strength, the payoff of power is full adulthood, which is actually more glorious and more of a high, that yes, in fact, does demand greater responsibility, but brings with it a, a joy that an avoidance of that will never bring, then you will attract to you the people who want to be grown-ups with you. 
And the, the, the real story, the news, is not how bad things have been in your life. The news is how good they could be. And the, how good they could be will be brought forth into manifestation exactly to the extent that you want it to be good. So if you want it to be good, stop talking about how bad it has been and concentrate on how good it can be in this moment. And how good it can be in this moment has to do with how much you want to give to this moment. And how much you want to give to this moment has to do with how much of your strength you want to give to this moment. And if you wonder where your strength is going to come from, remember God created it. It's there. Put it out. If you, you know, you act it enough, you become it. You want to be strong and magnificent? Just act strong and magnificent. And then the next moment, act strong and magnificent. And then the next moment, figure out what it would be like to act strong and magnificent. And I promise you, before you know it, you will be strong and magnificent. Thank you very much. Amen.